Okay, guys, welcome to another video. Um, yep, I interviewed John here um, last week, and due to the amount of time we actually spoke for, I figured let's put this out over a number of videos. So this is part one. Part two will be along in a few days. Hope you enjoy. Anyway, guys, listen, welcome to another Blame It's Only. Um, yeah, listen, to say I am excited about this next guest is an understatement. Um, I don't really need to in introduce him. I mean, you can see who he is, uh, Mr. John here, a.k.a. Mr. Sensible uh, Sensible Software. Listen, John, thank you very much for joining me tonight. Hello. Hello. Yeah, how are you? Are you all right? Okay. Good to see you. Good, good stuff. I'm it's all right, not be... too bad, yeah. Uh, yeah. Relax. <laughs> It's going to be a slightly shorter one uh, because a small thing called uh, the football's on in the 55 minutes. I was going to say to John we could do it tomorrow yeah. night. He's like, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess tomorrow night I'll have to be excited for crying, yeah. Depending <laughs> on the result, you might think, Chris, I wish I'd bloody joined Mainmeister last night. But anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how it goes. So, listen, John, just I, like, I always like to kick, kick things off. How did you yeah. first become aware of computer video games? Was it the arcades or was it... You know, you're kind of well, the same age as me, you know, so. I was born in 66, so, I mean, you know, I grew up without computer games around the house at all. You know, we just, there weren't, in 1966, there weren't any. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I was six months old when England won their only trophy. <laughs> so <laughs> let's hope let's hope we're going to double it up <laughs> every 55 years. So, yeah, um, the first time I ever saw any computer game when I was at school, I was about eight like in my primary school. Yeah. So this would have been 74. And it was a it was just a version of Pong on those controllers as old Pong. Yeah. It was brought in as part of a school fate. You know, like you've got hit the rat on the head as it comes down the drain <laughs> pipe and chuck the ball through the little holes in the bit of wood. Yeah. It was like yeah. it was like it was there in that in that in that thing with a like a cake stall and all the other stuff. Throw sponges at the headmaster <laughs> and knock them into the water and yeah, things like exactly, that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but it was indoors. The sponges were out there. <laughs> <laughs> so so that that was your very first kind of introduction so yeah wait, did you visit did, where, where were you kind of born and bred from are you still doing well, in essex I, or are you oh. yeah yeah I've, I've, I've always lived around well mostly around essex so i've lived I, I live very near to cambridge now so i've also lived mm. sort of in cambridgeshire for, for, for a while so but I, I was born in like uh born in ilford in east london and then moved to romford and went to school in romford as a primary school in, in, yeah. in east london and then went to my well, senior school in chelmsford which is basically getting a bit further away from the center of, of london and then um i wandered i moved back around london in different areas for a couple of years and then when we had a young family me and my wife moved out to the fens in cambridgeshire so oh, nice, like, nice. most of the most of the like the really famous sensible games from the 16-bit era like sensible soccer and cannon fuller were made in an office in march uh in the uh the fens oh really yeah yeah, yeah. so did, did so, you get the art did you get i take it you had quite like arcades about you when you were growing up in the sort of oh, late when 70s, I was, early when 80s I, yeah when i was growing up like i, I used to get a 10 a 10 mile bus ride to school every day in, in chelmsford Bloody hell, I lived in, in a little tiny town called South Wood and Ferris that no one's heard of. And um, <laughs> uh, and so to kill the time waiting for the bus, which often just just didn't pick you up if you if you're stepping at full, um, I would just go to the arcade. So that actually, in the end, I worked out the best place to go was to walk to the bus station to make sure actually the bus actually picked me up, which was like about a mile and a half, two miles. But there was an arcade right next to the bus station. In Chelmsford, so when I was maybe about fourteen or whatever, that's where I'd have started playing Centipede and Asteroids, and you know, all the all classics. That. The thing is, yeah. back in this, back in the early eighties, I mean, I didn't live anywhere near arcades, but there was, you know, chip shops, taxi ranks, you know, anything chip at shops. all. There was, ah, you know, <laughs> yeah, there were, and also a mate of mine from when he was when I was twelve, he had like an Atari VCS in his house. So if I went to go around his house after school, he lived quite close to school. Yeah. I could like play a, like a few games on that, like the very early that tank battle game, if you remember. And there's a Grand yeah, Prix like combat. Combat was called. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Two I mean, players. <laughs> there was a, and then I didn't get one of those in my house till I was seventeen. So we were well behind the times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we had, so what? What was the very first computer you actually owned? I presume you owned a computer at some point. Well, the VCS came into the house at seventeen, but. I started working in games when I was 19. So when I was 19, um, well, when I was 18, 
I kind of quit college and said to my dad, me and my mate are in a band, you know, I mean, I've been a musician my whole life. And yeah, uh, it's like, it'll be okay. But well, it wasn't okay. It didn't work out. But um, my mate, Chris, had, my school friend, Chris, who I was in the band with, became a, taught himself how to program, and, you know, um, he managed to work his way into a job locally as a computer programmer, as we tried to record our music and just couldn't get anywhere with it. And, um, and so I, I did some art for Chris to help him out on something he was doing for the guys who he'd got a bit of a work with. They liked my work and they offered me a job. And that was it. That's how we started. Ah, right. So it was Chris, Chris Yates that obviously he was the coder and you did, were you, were you at art college at all? Or the art you... he was, yeah. yeah, basically he was code. I was art. We kind of designed it together and, um, yeah, we did the business together at the start. Yeah. Obviously, most most kids our age, certainly me, because I was probably stupid. I was more interested in just playing video games. I didn't have a clue about programming. How did? Well, you've just explained. Was, yeah. Were you were you a video game player? Were you in your video games, and then you thought, oh, I quite quite enjoyed kind of messing about well, with well, art. Well, and, well, yeah. Me and Chris were like a creative partnership. You know, we were songwriting together for since we were fifteen, actually, at school. So we did that for like three or four years before we touched games. And I think that helped us to have a creative partnership. I don't know if you're involved in music at all, but, you know, you get to, to, to work together and to know, to bounce off of each other with ideas, to give the other guy space mm-hmm. and to compliment what you're doing. And um, even with, with music, like Chris was the guy who would uh, record the stuff and we recorded it. He was always fixing, like, effects pedals for his guitar. And I was, like, more interested in the singing, the, the, the words... Uh, learning rhythm guitar at that point on bass. Mm-hmm. You know, Chris was a more advanced guitarist than me. So we kind of had complementary skills even then. And we just kind of transitioned that over to games. Like he did the more technical stuff. I did the more arty stuff. We were both creative and both designing in our own way. And we kind of like fused that. And that's how it works. And, we, you know, it was good. It was a good combination of guys. Yeah, a good time. Like- I'm kind of jumping ahead a wee bit, but it's interesting you say that because one of the kind of comments I was going to make is sensible software. You did kind of portray yourself as this band type mentality. And I think obviously the fact that you've just explained that you were a band first yeah, and foremost. We were a band. And, and then and you we, transitioned we, into software writing. Yeah. We always saw it as a band. I mean, as we as we added, like Martin Galway joined us next and Martin was, was obviously a musician and a great musician. Yeah. Yeah. And then Martin went and, and as Martin went, uh, he went to America to join Origin. Uh, and then we kind of took on, after a little bit of time, a few more guys and a couple more programmers, Chris Chapman, Jules Jameson, and then Stu Cambridge, an artist, Dave Korn yeah. came, Richard Joseph was there, and other guys were coming in. And it just really felt like a band, mm-hmm. not just because it was the way we were thinking, but the guys we were working with, like Richard Joseph and Dave Korn, and they felt like that anyway. So it, it felt like we were just accumulating this group of guys around us and i think that we very much come from a uh, um record industry thinking model mm-hmm. as, as a band um it, it's a bit extreme to say it but um we were we were fans of stuff like pink floyd and, and rush but also bands like yeah. gong i don't even know gong it was crazy I, psychedelic band you do right, no no i don't i'm not oh, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a rocker i'm a rocker at heart but i don't i'm not, I'm not familiar <laughs> don't with a bit of a crazy out there kind of like Anglo, French, Australian combo <laughs> psychedelic band, but they they created this idea that they were like a collective, and um, uh, and some of the stuff was good, and some of it was a bit weird, and and we kind of adopted this kind of mentality like a band, like we were just a collection of guys going out and making stuff, and um, of course it it worked. I mean, we we happened to, and I didn't realise until we got to like the the mid nineties and we had to really flesh the team out with loads more people because the 3d machines demanded more yeah, guys. Yeah. I didn't really appreciate how talented all the guys that worked for us were, you know, we, we were very lucky to have no duff guys in the team at all up mm-hmm. until 93, 94. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the first time we'd have even seen anyone who wasn't really up to it. So yeah, we were, yeah, it was it was it was a good time. Yeah, yeah. You know, what I was what I always thinks meant. I was very lucky to uh, I've I've met Sean Southern and Andrew Morris. Uh, Magnetic Fields did all mm-hmm. the, the Lotus Turbo Challenge, and what I was what blew me away was when I said, "So how many guys worked on the Lotus series?" Expecting that we say, "Oh, there was like 50 and he's like, "Me and him." You're like, yeah, having exactly. a laugh. <laughs> you, you think <laughs> you know? Look at nowadays. I mean, these uh, the latest Call of Duty. There must be like it must be like tens of millions, probably more than that. Budgets, thousands of people. Eh? 
it, it really like you know when when you went from 2d graphics to 3d graphics that was the explosion because yeah. you needed a lot more programming power to deliver the graphics and you needed even more artists to make all this content mm -hmm. and, and 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 it did it changed the whole dynamic of making games it was it was the equivalent of being in a band and suddenly you needed to be in an orchestra you know yeah it, yeah it was that different i mean i remember we went sensible at its peak me and me and chris and martin it was like two stroke three people in the whole commodore 64 era so we whizball micro soccer parallax all that stuff shit my construction it was just like two of us I mean, Martin sometimes adding, you know, his music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let me go to the, the like they say, the 16-bit era, and you've got Cannon kind of Fodder, um, Sensible Soccer, WizKid, Sensible Golf. Megalomania and all that, yeah. 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 I mean, that's six guys mm -hmm. doing that. And we were doing those, like, crossing over. So we were doing two at once, at least, sometimes three. So, um, you know, and then you go to the next phase, which was, for us was our failure, which was the, the 3D sensible soccer yeah, and then know. sex rock, rock and roll have a nice day that's three games but on the newer formats like the next bit after 16 bit yeah and then you got 20, then you got 22 guys and and i remember looking at that and we were struggling with that we were struggling to we had such tight control of everything we have very mm -hmm. few guys very passionate very focused mm -hmm. you don't mm -hmm. worry about the communication channels because you're permanently in the room with each other talking to each other yeah yeah I mean, you've got 20 odd guys and like keeping on top of everyone becomes a bit harder we had zero middle management because we weren't that those kind of guys we weren't a corporation we were a fucking band you know so then so then <laughs> i looked at we sat down with our accountants and we said okay what are we going to do next and we worked out to go to the next phase of what we'd need to do after that phase we kind of failed at the, the, the early 3d stuff mm -hmm. we worked out we need 80 guys like to do the next phase of what we needed to do and we were just like we're out yeah it's yeah. basically not what we self to do so it does it does you're right i mean the and now, like you say, you need 500 guys to make one game in Call of Duty, or 500 is probably yeah. an underestimation. So, aye, aye, aye. So, so, so it's it's kind of, it really changed. And a lot of people don't get the vibe change in, in, in a team, you know. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And then the, it changed in a lot of ways because you had also a big dynamic change within the team. So when we started off, like being controlling and, managing the design and then managing the team i mean we made all of those games at sensible without even the concept of a producer internally mm -hmm. we just like us just getting on with stuff and making sure no one messed up too bad and then we had external producers from like virgin and uh, uh warner renegade palace whoever that we were working mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. suddenly you've got this dynamic where uh, a producer is really important because bigger media companies came in. They wanted to see someone was in control. And yeah, then you had this yeah. huge change to programmers being more dominant because the programming was so difficult. Mm -hmm. And so as a designer, which I am, it takes you further and further away from being in the, the driving I, seat. Yeah and, then, yeah. and then and then you add on now, like in the modern era, like where we are now on games we're making, all the social media stuff and all of the – internet connection and server stuff and mm -hmm, all of mm -hmm. that again it just drives focus and attention and control away from making a great game into yeah, just making yeah. sure this shit works at all you know and mm -hmm. so we've had various stages where in the old days like that real ability to say right we've got this amount of memory on the machine and we want to do this and no one could disagree with you or say oh but this or oh but they need that it was just like there was no restrictions from the platform holders. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there was just a publisher saying, let's make a great game. We're in this together. You get this percent. We got that percent. Let's make as much money as we can. And let's make as good a thing as we can. And it's mm -hmm. become very, very, very complicated now. Yeah. Think, yeah. You know, that, that kind of process has, has interfered with the, the, the creative energy we could feed off without really caring about it too much. I, I. I yeah. think, I mean, back then you were like, a, you were probably a video gamer first and foremost, and you were, you loved coding, and it was a passion. 
nowadays it's like the X Factor type thing. You know, I want I want to write games. You go to university and you learn to write games, and it's it's just become a big business. It's it's lost its sort of gr- ground roots that it was, and you know, you're 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 so right. I mean. I, I di- again didn't appreciate. I used to work daily with geniuses in a, their fields yeah. uh, in the old days because people were innovating. We were innovating. You know, sensible. We innovated a lot on our different games. Of, you know, Megalomania was the first game with the tech tree, and Sensible Soccer, Sensible World of Soccer, was the first game with this huge world of sport with guys from different countries and everyone <laughs> looking different and all that kind of stuff. And you know, shoot 'em up construction obviously was an early thing to help people make games, and we didn't really think or we didn't intentionally. Um, try to be the first or whatever. We were just running on creative thoughts. And you're right, the whole, to a certain extent also, in the UK particularly, we had a good foundation for creative work equaling money. Like we all had been exposed to music Mm -hmm. and we'd seen so many British musicians in so many different types of music become successful, make money, have creative credibility, and we highly value creative credibility in our country. We've got no idea how much more we value it than nearly every other country in the world. You know, mm-hmm. other people want to make, they want to make a bit of money or they were interested in the marketing side or they're very, ha- I met a, a Turkish guy once, interesting cab ride with a Turkish banker. And he said, to be honest, in our country, we just want to duplicate things, sell them and make a bit of money on the unit we're selling. You know, that's it. And that for, for, he was saying, this is what drives the country. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in the games world, that's kind of not where we came from. Our view has always been, as a Brit anyway, let's make the best game possible. If it's good and we market it well, it's going to sell well and we'll make money out of the back, off the back of it. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like you don't want the money. It's like the money isn't the driver. The money is the byproduct of the success. Of course it is. It's funny, it's, it's funny. I was talking. I was actually. I, I watched a channel the other day. They're an American channel, and this guy he literally just started YouTube. And the first five minutes was, "Oh, can you get? Please subscribe to my channel. Please do Patreon. If you can't afford to watch my channel, set your iPad, put turn the volume down, start, let it watch all my videos so I can get my views up. And I need to get money. And then, and, yeah. and I just reported. It. I says, "Dude, you need to chill out." I says, "You're coming across as fucking desperate." I says. If it's a hobby like mine's, I says you need to be passionate about what you do because if you're not passionate, people are going to click quickly realise there's so so many of these channels. You, I just get bored and it's but, but, but you know you've got to want to do it. I says you'll get a loyal following. People will want to watch your videos, and yeah. then later on you can sub, you can maybe monetize it, and that will come itself. But you've got to, you've got to, you've got to be focused. You've got to want to do it first. Don't try and say I want I'm, I'm want to do it for money. Which this guy's in. I says forget it. I mean, everyone wants as much money as they can get. I, I think that's a, a given, right? All of, of us. Course it is. Yeah. I mean, within reason, you don't want. You know, mm. I, I would even say maybe there's times in my life I could have made more money by making decision A over decision B. But to me, there's other things which are important as well as the money. And I've I've been lucky. I've been pretty loaded since I was in my twenties, you know. So I'm in a privileged position to say it. But it's not all about as much money as you can get. It's getting a life balance, you know. It's like having some creative credibility still doing what you want to do, still being able to like have a family and normal life as well. And, you know, it's mm-hmm, it's just mm-hmm. creating that balance of things you need in your life. And I think people, I think at the top end, some very over-publicised people have lost sight of this. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of young people mm-hmm. see this and kind of, what do you want? I want to be famous. Well, I'll tell you what, yeah, yeah. up until the 90s maybe, there wasn't a career about being famous. You did something, you were really, really good at it. And then if you were lucky, you had a bit of fame for a while, you know. You didn't suddenly, you know, pick the fame box and get the job, you know. Even even guys like David Beckham, he became famous because yeah. he practised relentlessly again aye, and again. Aye, aye. A free kick and then became very talented and got the fame as a result of that, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I know. I suppose back in the 70s, it was like serial killer, instant fame, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, you, you can always that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Infinite, yeah. 
Listen, I'm just conscious of time, John. I've got abs- I've got stacks okay. of questions. I'm desperate to kind of well, hear you talk about. Well, we can do this in two phases. If you want to do it later, a bit more tomorrow or whatever, that's fine. But we've well, got other football pools today, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, well, if we could maybe catch up for part two, that would be superb. I don't, I don't want yeah. to kind of rush it because I just like, you know, I know guys. Yeah, no, you get the best you. Actually. Let's just chat. Yeah, go on. No, Fire that's, that's, that's grand. So, obviously, I think it was, it was the LT software that Chris... Worked for that was according to yeah yeah, yeah. So, so yeah it, it must be true yeah like, so Chris lived in Chelsea I live in this little place called Wooden Furs and they're in Essex and uh, uh, Basildon which is up the road a bit better known um, these guys from LT Software um, had a, a job going and Chris had, Chris had taught himself how to program by getting um, spectrums off of K's catalogues and stuff. So rather than get malingering in the underwear section, he'd gone like <laughs> the computer section and worked out you can get a computer for a month and then send it back. So we did this three times. It was Kay's Littlewoods and, and one other. I don't know which other the other one was. But in those three months, he taught himself to program, made a demo of Snoopy flying around on a ZX81 screen, took it to LT Software and got offered a job. So that's quite in, ingenious like on the, like on the back of it. hiring a spec or hi, hiring a computer for absolutely bugger all, yeah, or not hiring, yeah, no, borrowing no, it, yeah, yeah, borrowing <laughs> it, sending it back, and that that's how that's how he got his break. He then got offered a job by them to convert a game from a Vic Twenty or something like that, an Oric or whatever, mm-hmm. to a to the ZX eighty one called Sword of the Sorcerer, which is a silly game about a wizard zapping dragons trying to come and invade his castle. Um, and then that was the game where I was around Chris's house one day. We were recording a track, and Chris said, "I've been doing this programming stuff, and I can't do this art of these dragons or these wizards or whatever." And that, I stepped in and did that, and for my mate, and they they said to Chris, do "You know, give your friend a job," which is how I got my job. Then we did another game called Twister, which was our first sensible software game people know about, which was for LT Software. It wasn't officially sensible software, but there's a cheat key where you can get sensible software made by sensible software popping up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and those were the days when you had the government enterprise schemes. And if you remember, I mean, there, was, there weren't a lot of jobs around in the early 80s. No, and that uh, was not. and uh, the government were trying to push young people like ourselves, we were both 19 at the time, to to work for themselves, if you can. And they offered this thing called a government enterprise scheme where they give you 40 quid a week each for a year. Uh, the only snag was you needed to have been on the dole for 13 weeks and you needed a grand in the bank each. Um <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go figure, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we, anyway we worked out how to do it so um we uh after twister we did another game uh called runescape uh it was a no not runescape it was called runestone sorry not runescape that would have made us a bit of money um runestone and uh it was a conversion to the commodore 64 uh we were offered by ot software to do it the the, the um the payment was exactly two grand uh so we signed on for 13 weeks <clears throat> made the game in those 13 weeks got our two grand signed off and that's qualified for the government enterprise scheme because uh we've been unemployed exact 13 amount weeks. of money oh, that's super yeah, yeah yeah he's very lucky the game actually never came out it wasn't released so mm-hmm. but um um and we uh set sensible software up in march of 1986 does it say that? I've not, I didn't. I didn't know that from Wikipedia. So that, that's. So at what point did you decide? Yeah, you, you thought. You thought. Well, man, there's there's money to be made. So let let's set up our own company. Yeah, I mean, it was, it, yeah. was, it was. Like I said, the government was kind of like pushing this, and it's it was one of the one of the good things the Thatcher government did was to like encourage younger people to set companies up. Um, and yeah, so we did it. We had a, the bank manager wasn't too sure about what we had no idea what computer games were in those days. My God. <laughs> But um, then we had a bank account. We 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 started working on a new game, which is called Parallax. Um, yeah. We were very lucky. We had a demo after two or three months. We took it to Ocean Software, and we got a deal the first day we did business. So. Oh, no, su- no surprise. I mean, suffice to say that uh, I mean, well, your games are anything but sensible. So was was the, the choice of the sensible software kind of just a bit like any Monty Python moment or something, or was that? A- I, I honestly don't know. I think we were probably both stoned when we chose the name. Um, I know I liked it because I wrote down this S, Ensible, and then Offball, and then E. So 
both game name words start with S and N with E, and they're both eight letters. So when did this logo with a big S at the start, a big E at the end, and like oh, it's, yeah. off the wall. And uh, that was kind of um, uh, that's the first thing I remember. I don't remember. I don't remember where the name came from, but it kind of worked, so we just kept it. And uh, mm-hmm. we we'd been used to doing offbeat music miles before then, so we knew that we were unlikely to be that conventional. Uh. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. I mean, you, you released not a large number of eight-bit games, uh, and though it's, it's fair to say that those that you did put out were absolutely technically outstanding mm-hmm. from a graphical, audio, and playability perspective. Yeah. I mean, Parallax. Sorry, I'm just I'm, I've got you on there, and I'm reading my, my, my notes. That's all right, <laughs> But um, Parallax, obviously, it got some fantastic reviews. It had amazing graphics, astonishing title, oh. title track written by Martin Galway. How did yeah, Martin brilliant. come on board? Did you know him from school? or how, how no, did you no, get no, 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 no. Martin was with Ocean. Martin was an 18-year-old oh, kid. So he was, was I. And uh, yeah. uh, I remember we were we were introduced to Martin by, like, Gary Bracey, our producer there. I know. I've interviewed Gary. Gary's a, a lovely yeah, guy. Gary's Hi. a great guy. Totally, anyway, yeah. the Gary said, "Oh, there's this, there's this, this. We got this in-house musician called Martin, and he's written this tune for your game." And we were like, "Okay," and we went down to see Martin, and Martin was kind of like, he had like one of them funny little moustaches you have when you're 18, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he was like, I've, "I've written this tune, see what you think." You know, it's like only a young kid, really. Aye. And it totally blew me away. I remember, like, it gives you goosebumps listening to it. When, when I first presented that in a little in a room, a presentation Aye. room in Ocean's office, I was blown away. It was something very incredible, and um, yeah, yeah, we were lucky to get him. Yeah, I've got I've got a mate, uh, Panther UK, Chris. Um, apparently, he, he said to me, he was at one, he was at an event a, years ago, and he saw you, and he went, "Oi, John!" And you went, "Yo." They went, cheers for Parallax and Wizball. You went, no problem, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Chris, right. Chris uh, he's got a, I don't understand it, he's got a, a, a twin SID C64. So we, okay. what he basically does is he records SID tunes in stereo. And he's put out, uh-huh. he's, 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 he's put out a lot of albums. Yeah, he always contacts the guys. But uh, I've listened to uh, Parallax downstairs. I bought myself a, I had a right hankering for a proper good old-fashioned record deck and CD player. Uh-huh. So I got one for 100 quid of country, uh, set up in my living room, and I put this on, I put it on the CD, and having Parallax and stereo coming out a proper yeah. sound system is something great, pretty special. Yeah, Absolutely. it sounds great. Just that's, awesome. how I, that's how I first heard it. Yeah, it it's away. amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, back, is, in, a, back in 1986, that totally blew me away. Aye, that was just absolutely staggering. Obviously, the next game to follow, Wizball took things to a new level. And I mean, I don't mind admitting, um, I personally rate Wizball as probably probably not not just the best uh, looking or sounding Commodore 64 mm-hmm. game, but best looking 8 bit game ever. It's just. Wow, it's, thanks. It's, no, I mean seriously, it's flawless. The minute you, you you switch it on and you just get the goal with track kicking in, it's 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 perfect, absolutely perfect. It really is. Yeah, I was disappointed. Go. On. No, I was going to say I was disappointed with the. the I, I I didn't. I had my my sixty four up for about five years. Sold it, got an ST. Couldn't wait to get uh, Wizball, and I was disappointed with the ST and Amiga one. They don't have the same kind of glow and kind of graphics. You know, the sixty four one has. It's. You're right. I mean, the as a as a as a game designer, uh, I've always cared more about the original version than the than the you know than the conversions because yeah. you put all your effort into making that that first one as good as you can. And I'm learning now. At the moment. It's another thing I'm learning at the moment. You know, we, our current game, Social Soccer, has got ten formats, and each one needs a bit of attention because of different reasons. So, but in those days, yeah, I mean, the conversions were just conversions. They were just on other machines, but you know, as a as a as a perfectionist, if you like, I cared about and um, we cared about the original one, not just me, me and Chris. Yeah, we we cared about the original one. The rest were just what they were. They were just the same game on a different machine. Uh, yeah. Made us a bit of money, and there wasn't a lot we could do about it, you know, because we didn't want the market to have loads of different machines, but it did have. So, mm-hmm. yeah, Whistball again, the ability to produce perfect is a difficult word but extremely good quality games in all areas with a few people in those days was a magical time you really can't do it now and mm-hmm. to get um 
like Chris was a, a genius programmer and Martin was a genius musician, you know. So I'm a lucky guy sitting in the middle. The graphics of graphics weren't too bad either. They weren't too shy. Yeah, 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 I did write the graphics. <laughs> I mean, and I discovered that, you know, I had the flair for design at that time to just, um, especially when we and Chris working together, we could just make stuff up, make it happen and then go away and do it. So I think that um, it's really easy to make great stuff with great people. But when you've had, as you touched on earlier, so many people entering in the industry for different reasons, some who just want some money, some who just want to learn, see it as a business, some who just see it as a technical exercise because they're from a technical background. Mm -hmm. None of these guys get what we're doing, which is making a great piece of art, the same way you'd make mm -hmm. a film or you'd make a great piece of music or write a great book. Yeah. It's the same. And mm -hmm. there's so now the, the volume of people that think like that has been so diluted. And mm -hmm. the main difference is that the, the the channels that we sold through people used to go to independent game shops to buy games right yeah or they'd go to boot or wherever yeah, in the yeah. uk but these guys who sold you the games the independent game shops, they were big fans and gamers themselves yeah so they're like yeah there wasn't this horrible there wasn't a bureaucratic layer at any stage you know commodore was the coolest company going for making computers it really was mm -hmm. you know so they didn't even want, they didn't control the platform. They didn't want their slice of the money from the games. They were just making a machine for us to make stuff. Yeah, yeah. And there was just no resistance. There wasn't resistance from retail or from the manufacturer or from the publisher because the publishers could make these great original games and, and they could get sell units. So therefore we could get deals from making the games. So the zero resistance all the way down the chain from developer right through to retailer meant that we could, the guys who were, the most innovative and technically strong at that time that was important so innovative mm -hmm. in design and technology we were the guys who were winning you know mm -hmm. and there was a lot of us in the uk you know our sensible just one example mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good times but, yeah no awesome um i mean i think it's fair to say the idea of whiz ball and paper is pretty batshit mental um, you play the part of a, a wizard in case in a green shell with eyes and a mouth controlling a robot cat which you used to collect paint dropped by fallen bodies so you restore colour to the world. How the hell did you sell that to Ocean or did you just load well, it and they're like, there's the money? <laughs> basically, <laughs> who's like, who's like, there was it? I mean, Sensible as a company worked in a certain way. Um, all of our games were heavily iterated. So we didn't start off going we're going to do exactly what you described there. Yeah. Instead yeah. of saying, we're making a new game. Do you want to buy it? Here's a picture. And it was a bit like in the old days where a, a band would go and say, you know, they've got a bit of a name. We've got a new album. Do you want to sign it? That's how we got it signed. So because we had people like Gary Bracey or Matthew Timms or uh, Graham Boxall or um, Tony Beckwith, these are all our producers from those days. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Pete Hitman. They had so much trust in us creatively. They gave us freedom. They, they didn't. Do. Yeah. They, they, they didn't want a speck of what Whizball was. We just showed them a ball bouncing around and firing some stuff. And then you make it up as you're going along. So Whizball started. I went around to Chris's house. We were working from Chris's house in the, in the spare bedroom with Flintstones wallpaper on the walls. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he had this ball. He had this. this it was just a circle at that point. He said, I've got this small circle thing and it kind of spins and, and it bounces and, you know, I'm not sure what we can do with it, but it's pretty cool. And um, so I said, oh, let me try drawing something. So I drew the, the mouth with eyes <clears throat> because it was easy to see the rotation with, with something on it, actually. Yeah, aye, and aye. This aye. Around, and it's like, what do we do? Let's make something a little bit like Nemesis with weapons that you grow. He was into Nemesis and Salamander and all those from the arcade, so. We added all these bolt-on weapons, which were very trendy in the arcade at the time. And then we came up with the satellite going round <clears throat> to pick up the paint. What, ca catalyte? The cat well, it was catalyte. Oh, was it yeah, yeah. Was satellite, right? And uh, <clears throat> it was a, it was a, the idea was, yeah, the, I, I don't know if we nicked it from another game, but the idea was that you could, 
also because we played drop zone where you had two players doing this, someone else could do the smart bomb. We wanted a game where you could have two players in separate functions. Uh, of course, it was two players, eh? Oh, yeah, yeah, that. uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so, so we had this other connected partner you could either control yourself or a second person could control, mm. which is very similar to drop zone. <clears throat> and, um, and then he did the firing sound for it. And the firing sound, by accident, went meow, 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 meow. So then we called it a catalyte. <laughs> so it came from the sound of it. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, and then we were like, okay. When I was at college, I studied um, theatre design, and there's a there's a there's a section about lighting in that. And I got pretty fascinated about the way the different colours are mixed in light. Mm. You know, like you put a a red slide and a green slide, and you get a yellow light and all this kind of stuff, which was exactly the same as the RGB stuff from pixels coming out the screen. And so I got into this concept of mixing colours. So then there was a, then it came like, well, let's obviously with a, a Commodore sixty four, you're limited by two colours in a, in a in a block, right? Yeah. So it's like, how can we use this? What about if we start it off grey and then we add colour because it also adds more use of the colour. You got to remember that Commodore sixty four, the colour was a big deal in those days. We'd come out of the spectrum, which had like not half as much as that. So. Um, so then we added the concept of colouring in, and there's like, how do we work this colouring in? So then we said, well, why don't we have this RGB mix? The colours are made from RGB. So we'll have RGB mix. How do we do that? When you shoot the enemies, they drop the colours. So then you drop those and you have to collect them. So now you've got a second process. You've got the first player shooting, and then the second player scooping up the reward gotcha. for the yeah. deck, right? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, and I'm sure at least one element of that is Nick from Defender. Anyway, so then, so then, um, once you've got the paint, you just need to set the targets to complete the color. So obviously, you set different different colors in different levels, so they look different. Um, so you set the targets to color them in, and then it was, how do we um, graphically show that? So we had the idea that you'd go and mix the paint, and then you get the idea of the wizard. Much later than the start of the game, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it was obvious. It was obvious that we needed to mix the paint, so you'd mix it in a, a cauldron, so we could use a wizard, and then the cat noise. And the other thing had to be a cat, you know. <laughs> so then you had the stupid parking. The parking meters is just a stupid joke. It comes out the <laughs> idea. You know, the parking meters, they park the big ball and the little ball. They get out. They stir, stir the paint, and of course, the paint then colours the land in, and it appears to be. A totally thought out and executed idea from the start, mm. but it really, really wasn't. I mean, so I, I, yeah. I wanted to add stuff in Wisbon. Mm. I can't really remember what it was now, but we went kind of underground. So in Parallax, mm. you had the scientists running around on the land to collect all the, the like the passwords and stuff. If you remember, so so I like I wanted something Wisbon where you went underground, and I can't really remember what you were meant to do. And it ended up being they flew to the laboratory, it's kind of like a whatever, but. You add that, and then you add the, the nice touches like the, the filth raid and the um, the different <laughs> drops to do weird stuff like making the whole world black and you know yeah you yeah. And these are all very much in keeping with arcade machines at the time. Aye, really. Aye. So it was, it was a pretty kind of organic way you built built games, wasn't it? They just it was really you, organic. You know, it really was. I mean, yeah. You know, the, the most organic of all the most the two most organic were megalomania and whiskey they really changed hugely during development hugely mm. um yeah i mean we've we've always i mean i've always liked to work that way i mean not everyone likes to work that way most people don't actually um in the modern era people don't like it they like to know what they're doing from the start mm -hmm. ideally just replicate mm -hmm. and knock it out um mm -hmm. but no we've always we always said you kind of like take a third of thing a and a third of thing B, and a third of your new ideas, and you stick them together to get something. Yeah, and that's kind of what we accidentally always did. But it's very iterative. Mm. You, you kind of you feed from the game. You feed from what the game tells you it needs. Actually, mm. when you're making a game, you should have enough feel from your game to know what it needs. Mm -hmm. uh, but importantly, the programming's got to be rock solid enough to actually be able to fix it. So what, yeah, I've, yeah. what I've discovered in recent years is working with different teams of people who maybe are more complex games technically now, but it's harder to have that control over the programming base to go, right, as an idea, the game needs this, and then to instantly be able to, like, turn it your way. Because now mm -hmm. the amount of systems underneath dealing with 
all sorts of stuff to do with the graphic rendering, to do with going online and all this kind of stuff. They often make it harder to just hone and perfect like a sculptor would because there's always a technical reason why you can't just chip that last bit off its shoulder. Uh, something will collapse somewhere uh, else. Yeah. Uh, back, back in the early days, you could you could tweak something and it wouldn't really affect that much. But nowadays, if you were to suddenly change a core function of something, they would say, no, oh, no, no, you can't do that because this guy's done the graphics and he's done this, blah, 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 blah. So it's... A lot of it's to do with technical setup. So, for example, mm. on our current game, the issue is the game is always talking to the server to do certain things. And certain things are held on the server and certain things are held on the client. And you might want to do something really simple, like can we change the order so that screen A comes after screen B instead of before screen B? Because it makes more sense. Mm -hmm. And the answer is normally no, because of something totally not related to that. And, and, and the, these decisions on structure need to be taken so early in the process now. Yeah. And, that's not really how the best design processes work. The best design processes work where you are able relatively easily and without too much damage to the structure to change stuff later on. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. But everything mm -hmm. seems to like root back to various cores quite a lot. So yeah. it's, uh, that's what's made things slightly harder these days with, mm -hmm. with, with certain games, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know when I, I spoke to I've, I've made I've known Jeff Minter for quite a long time since first going on to his uh, Yak Yak uh, forum yeah. back in 2000 I think it was and uh, Jeff said that the very very first thing he does when he makes any game is he just gets the character whether it's a pixel and he gets the movement perfect he says yeah. once you've nailed that then everything else is relatively easy now I think suffice to say that one of the apart from the, the the game, the sensible games looked astonishing. Mm -hmm. They sounded brilliant. It was the, it was just the, the really, really fantastic controls. Sensible soccer, you know, it was mm -hmm. awesome. Whiz ball, all these games. Uh, the controls were just absolutely spot on. And I found that when you brought out the, 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 the sort of the, the yeah. conversions. They just lost it. I mean, I, I remember, I don't want to kind of, what, what I was thinking, John, is shall we, will we do this at eight-bit years and then we'll, we'll stop and maybe do a, a 16-bit yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. that way we don't have to rush it. I just um, want to say something about Jeff. So uh, when, before we'd got into, like, being known for making games, when we were just first starting out, we found this thing called CompuNet Chat Online, which was a very, <laughs> very early chat system. Do you remember it? I was on that, yeah. I used to go on it. Yeah. I was just an unknown there, but... But, but, but um, that, we, we first met Jeff Minter on there. I think he went under the name of PC Plod or something like this. What was he called? Yeah. PC Plod. <laughs> Don't remember that. Something like that, yeah. And it was Jeff Minter. <laughs> well, uh, or maybe we were PC Plod and he was Yak. I don't remember. Anyway, it was, it was one day. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to convey this. Losing the total control you used to have. I mean, we used to have mm. control of every pixel on the screen. You know, you didn't have all the graphics were made pixel by pixel. You know, everything was tightly exactly as we wanted it. And what's crept in over starting with the 90s, somewhere in the 90s, but the concept of patching instead of just fucking doing it right in the first place. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All of this stuff. And it's because the computers became too complex and that the processes became too unwieldy i guess but yeah i mean it's not as satisfying as delivering something like whizball and when people go you know we didn't even need bug testing because we found all our own bugs you know we just mm -hmm. tested the bloody thing to death so it was it worked mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and there is something in me which obviously we've left that era behind now but it's immensely frustrating that people can't seem to and i include that with many teams i work with can't seem to deliver error free product off the bat yeah yeah like we used to uh yeah. it's it's a stand it's a lack of standards actually is it do, it's, do, it's you think, acceptance of lower yeah. standards. do you think that it's like a lack of wanting to be lack of perfection on people's part um, is it they're not good enough, or do they think, ah, fuck it, let's just get it out there? Oh, Christmas come up, bang it out. We'll we'll stick out a, a ten meg update 
or 10 gig, I should say, update in the month after. I mean, some games you buy. Uh, I bought a game. What was it I bought? The Last of Us 2, whatever it was for my daughter. I bought it, mm-hmm. installed it, and I went to play it, and it was like, I need, I need to download an update. I like, I've just bought it. <laughs> you know, what's that all about? Bloody hell. I mean, I mean, it has just become, and it did come definitely when we were more exposed to American programming styles. We, we just, there was just this acceptance that there'd be errors and that you could fix them on the fly, which came more yeah. from a PC back. I think it started off in PC game more. And, mm. you know, we weren't immune to it. We did the odd patch with, with sensible soccer and stuff. I'm not saying we didn't do it, but we really, really, ruthlessly cleaned everything up um before we put it out and i think that the it's a culture it's a it's a, it's a culture in you know i'm not a programmer i can't claim to fix any of these bugs you know but mm-hmm. it's a culture of the way you do your work and your perfectionism and i, I also think that as we added more group programming into the way teams are constructed we started to see a huge amount more errors because when you've got one guy managing a code base, it it's all on him. And it was all him's and there were no hers really in those old days. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so they would get a process where they were always controlling it. They didn't have the bit they weren't sure of because someone else did stuff. They didn't have the third party software inserted in that, you know, apart from the odd stopping pirating stuff going in there. Um, mm. So, it was it was much more controlled and, and you know that's something I miss. I mean, you asked me what I miss most of all. It's it's fe- the feeling of control I, um, I, is what I miss most about the modern era. Yeah. I think the guys that I've spoke to over the years, I spoke to Jim Bagley and even Mister uh, Mister Beard, Kevin Toms, <laughs> and well, uh-huh. they, everybody everybody says uh, that they miss the old days. They would gladly go back to the old days in a, in a heartbeat. You know, yeah. would you would you be the same if you if you could go back? And program the way you did back in the eighties, and maybe make the same money you are now. Would you? Would you take that any day? To be honest, I mean, the 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 era between ninety two and ninety five for us, are sensible. We were we were in that era. Eventually, megalomania as well, although financially it kind of collapsed because of Mirosov falling off a boat. But in that era, <laughs> you know, we had between ninety one and ninety five, we had four or five number one games. We were number one for 52 weeks in a three-year period between June 92 and June 95. We made a huge amount of money. We had loads of fun. We did what the hell we wanted. We were working with great people. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I would happily live that forever. I mean, I I haven't enjoyed an era of computer game making as much as that 16-bit era. The the 8-bit era was fun, but we didn't make the money. The 16 bit, we had both, and that was the difference. Like, you had you, had, you, you know, you, you're making the games, you're getting the kudos, which is nice as an artist. We kind of feed on the ego being messed up, yeah, yeah. But we started to make money, you know. We didn't really make any money to speak of until our sixth year in business in our ninth game, which was Sensible Soccer. So, <laughs> people can easily not understand from the you can even look at great. Music artists now, you've got no idea what money they're actually making. But yeah, I'd actually go, I'd go back there forever. I mean, aye, aye. I, I, I don't think that the the modern era has been fun for me because I've travelled a lot of my work. I've met a lot of amazing people. I've really grown as a person from learning from that. But artistically, I would go back to that time. But I wouldn't. It was a, it was my own personal goal. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, I think these days are long gone. It's like anything. Things were far more simple, eh? but we've, we've, we've moved on and it's never going to go back to that, I don't think. No, no, it can't. Unfortunately. I mean, it, you know, yeah. it never goes backwards. Yeah. What, what's going to happen is a new whatever it is media is going to happen and there will be some people, probably quite young in that time, mm-hmm. who will be lucky enough to do what we did, you know, be in the right place at the right time, be good at what you're doing, work hard, and just ride that wave for as long as you can. I mean, I'm lucky. I've been doing it 35 years. I've never stopped making games. You know, I've just yeah. had sociable soccer is the biggest hit I've had for about 15, 20 years. So I'm happy mm-hmm. with that. Mm-hmm. And me, you know, but it's not going to eclipse, you know, Mick Lemania full, yeah. full of a can of fun and we whisper in the middle and then swap <laughs> and can of fun of two. And, you know, 
you can't. That, that, that was the golden era. And I'm, I'm going to be too old for that to happen to me again. I know that. <laughs> I'm very happy.